live webinar over universe under 25 lakh in USA, UK, Australia, and Canada. We have three packages that is bronze, silver, and gold. If you upgrade to silver and gold, you'll get extra benefits like evaluated mock tests, expert university recommendations, dedicated counsel for the entire application process, and so on. We also provide free profile evaluation with our experts, comprehensive evaluation, university shortlisting, course recommendations, recommendation reports, and doubt clearance. We also have Duolingo class Monday to Friday, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And live IELTS classes Monday to Friday, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And GRE classes Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. You can register for free. You can reach out our team for any other queries. We are also providing one-on-one -on -one IELTS classes starting from rupees 599 in the gold package. It includes 20 hours live classes, class recordings, daily class worksheets, and five full-length mock. Also, our today uh, speaker is Mr. Jaydeep. He is the alumnus of Bits Pilani and IAM Kozi Kore. He's also the co-founder of Ubergrad. Here are a few achievements. Thank you, and have Thank a you, great session. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I hope you can see me and hear me well. Uh, if I can get a quick thumbs up, I think we can get started with the session. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot. So let me share my screen. So I hope uh, you can see my screen and it's in full screen for all of you. Quick check from my side again. Yep. Thank you. So before we start, right? Uh, so obviously the agenda is uh, targeting at students. Uh, the today's session agenda is to help students who are planning to go abroad. Uh, these are the big four destinations that most of the Indians look at. Uh, this is what we're going to cover. If you have plans for other countries, some parts of the session would be helpful and some of it might not make sense for you. I still believe that it can be of some use if you have plans of going abroad as a whole. So US, UK, Australia and Canada. So first, what I want to do before I get into the session uh, is it would be great if I can understand the audience I have. Write a quick answer in the chat, uh, which country and which intake are you looking to go for? Uh, you might have multiple countries as, as preference. Maybe you can drop a few of them or whatever. Right, confused, uh, clear, uh, right out. Even if you can add a course, it's great. Just to give a quick introduction to me so that I know the audience. Yeah, thank you, Sai Sagarika. So, Paul 24 US, Akhilesh US, MS and CS. Okay, September 24, Abhishek. Soundarya US, Fall 24, MS and I have missed it. Business Analytics is okay, great. UK, September 24, Intake, uh, Mohammed Afzal Ansari. USA fall, fall 24, fall 24. More or less, everyone I'm seeing is in 24 is my assumption from just the answers. Just let me wait for three, four more answers. And I see heavy inclination towards USA uh, just in this. It'll be great if others can also show me if you have some uh, preference towards Canada, Australia, because the session answers all four. Uh, but if I get a feel that most of you are looking at US, maybe I'll stress a bit more on that and less on the other. UK also is something I'm seeing. Uh, two more. Australia, July intake. Thanks, Shubham. Okay. One more, and then we'll start the session. I mean, I hope the session will help you to understand few things in terms of planning universities and all of that. Okay. Venkat, Viparla, Canada. Great. So I think I have people from all, all the four destinations as such, uh, but most of it is looking at US. So this will be a good comparison and sort of giving you some tips on how to plan your master's as such. Uh, so just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so Ubergrad has two founders, Mr. Ravindra and myself. Both of us come from Bits Pilani and IM background. So both of us have our own experiences in different companies and we are uh, uh, you know, working towards uh, helping study abroad aspirants with the help of technology and data driven systems to make the system more transparent and easier. We are such a company which is openly helping students with both partnered, non-partnered and all kinds of universities. Uh, so without any difference or bias. Uh, okay, what are we going to talk about in this session? So obviously, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Uh, some of these things uh, must be, uh, you know, something sort of you are already aware of, but 
just to a quick recap and sort of uh, give you some pointers the average expenses typically that you would expect uh, then i have like five hacks that i'm going to talk about is the hacks as such i'm talking about is how do you fund it right so the objective of this session though we said it's under 25 lakhs i can clearly and confidently tell you it you can do your masters in us you can canada under 25 lakhs including every expense net net out of your pocket is what i'm talking about australia is one country which i would be a little bit wary of making a bold claim like that but around 30 35 lakhs i think you should be good enough with australia okay uh, but agenda is not to just tell you on how to do it under 25 lakhs but also the overall purpose is how do you fund yourself right so you have a dream of going to a good university and good course so my sessions agenda would be to help you figuring out uh, to do that particular course in the best possible university in the best possible budget right so that you don't have to stop your dreams so scholarships part-time opportunities and then some hacks in terms of choosing one year degrees over two year degrees choosing graduate diplomas especially this makes sense for canada uh, instead of universities master's program and then choosing low cost universities within the country uh, and then obviously the education loans is always there so i'm going to talk briefly about that also to clarify some of the aspects at the end i'll keep this open for q a uh, so the session would broadly run for 40 minutes from my side uh, I would try to keep uh, uh, one or two breaks in between in terms of looking at the chat and maybe if there's something relevant that I want to answer in terms of questions, I'll give that. Otherwise, I'll keep that open for the end. Uh, any personal or uh, you know, individual questions, I would be happy to take up at the end and we'll wrap up the session. Right, so first part about US, uh, this is an average cost. Uh, just I'm not saying this is like what you have to minimum bear it. Uh, keep in mind, I'm talking about average. Yes, you can do it below that but most of the students would more or less you know join a university which costs them around 30 lakh 35 lakh in terms of tuition fee for two years uh, again i'm telling you i'm not talking about a one-year course and stuff like that so typically assume if you're doing a two-year course you are going to spend see not us every country fundamentally the tuition fee more or less lies on your credit count even if you do in one year or two years the number of credits would more or less just stay same so it's more about what is the cost per credit so that more or less would come around $2,500, $2,000, something that boils down to 30 lakhs. Okay, then cost of living, I would say it's going to be universal, as in uh, uh, with minor changes here and there across the US, UK, Canada, Australia, the rule of thumb we generally talk about is 10 to 12 lakhs per year. So now, obviously, the house you stay, uh, the number of people you share with, how stingy you can be when you plan your groceries and all of that. Um, then don't spend on some extravagant stuff. Then the cities and states you live, like US, you are living in California. Obviously, the cost of living is going to be higher on New York, New Jersey, California versus living in Texas, Missouri, example. Uh, then UK, Canada, sorry, London versus not being in London, like Manchester, Liverpool, which are not so uh, you know big cities. So you're going to spend lesser amount. Australia, again, going for Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney versus being in you know Perth or uh, uh, be it Canberra's or Canberra's capital, but uh, not that costly comparatively. Maybe you can look at Keynes and all of Jackson Village, small towns, tier two, tier three towns. Canada, again, depending on whether you're, you know, staying at the capital cities of the provinces and stuff like that, Ontario's and all of that. So just as a rule of thumb, 10 to 12 lakhs, it's going to cost you around 60 lakhs on average in US. UK is something, uh, the best part about UK, obviously, out of all the four, in terms of pure money, UK wins it uh, hands down because they typically offer you a one year degree. That's something you rarely find in other countries, but mostly in UK, you find it very common. And that's going to cost you around 20,000 pounds. Yes, if you look at Imperial or Oxford, Cambridge, they cost around 35, 40,000 pounds for one year, which is 40 lakh. But typically, most of the universities that the students would be looking at would cost them 25,000 pounds, 15,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds. Uh, then one year cost of uh, expenses would be another 10 to a lakh. So more or less you can do it in 25, 30 lakhs if you're looking at, you know, limited budget where UK wins in that way. But uh, you also have an option to do a placement year. Uh, basically, that is you work for second year as an intern with the help of university. So that means your degree will come as two years. Typically, the second year is called industrial placement or practice, professional practice and professional year, etc. There they would expect you to pay three to five thousand pounds. That is three to five lakh more. They would help you to get internships where you'll be paid stipend, obviously. And you will be technically living two years there as a student, plus you'll get two years of postery work visa. So typically a four-year duration in UK before you transfer into a work uh, student. 
so that way even if you do a two year course uk offers a very low cost masters in terms of uh, the tuition fee then australia typically i mean the lowest you can expect is around 25 to 30 lakh for two years an average 35 to 40 lakh is what you can treat as the tuition fee uh, the cost of living obviously again 10 to 12 lakh sort of it, so it's going again cost on par with us uh, Canada, again, if you talk about universities, uh, it's slightly costlier than UK, but slightly lower uh, in terms of costs compared to US or Australia. You can do it in 25 to 30 lakhs, uh, two years of tuition fee in Canadian universities, and living expenses stay the same, so it's going to cost you around 50 lakhs. Then obviously, the hack people do is colleges, where you get the diplomas, uh, graduate certificates, graduate diplomas, not the actual master's which again can be ranged in the offer of one year to two years. So Canadian post-study work visa work with the concept of number of years you study as a student would be the number of years you get post to graduate to stay there as a potential student looking for a job. So if you do a one year master's or diploma, typically you're only eligible to stay for one more year before you migrate to work visa. So that is too short a period to really you know, settle down. So that's why people typically try to, you know, uh, extrapolate their time in Canada as a student by, you know, taking two years uh, diplomas or at least do one to one back to back within the same university to extend your uh, student duration to get longer uh, post study work visas. So if you do in college, you can do in 10 lakhs, 12 lakhs also, but typically 15 lakh average figure and then two years of expenses would come around 20 lakhs. So that's going to be 30, 35 lakhs. So now what uh, we're going to talk about with that in mind is now how do I get it under 25 lakhs, right? So which is, uh, I've talked about US say 55, 60 lakhs, Australia 55, 60 lakhs, UK typically 30, 35 lakhs. And then you have Canada, which is again around based on college to universities in the range of 30 to 50 lakhs. Okay. So first part, obviously scholarship, obviously every student would aim and hope that they would get a scholarship. So types of scholarships, what is the process? Uh, I'll just give a few examples of some of our candidates to give you some, you know, uh, ideas or rather insights in terms of how these scholarships work from you know different uh, parties involved so obviously there are scholarships like universities offer you scholarship you have dean merit scholarships and need based scholarships and stuff like that then you have private scholarships that companies offer like let's say if you get into stanford university for mba the dubai ambani scholarship is there which is going to fund the entire one crore worth of mba so that's going to be given for one indian student or two indian students if i'm not wrong uh, so every company would do that way to certain level of, you know, uh, portfolio of students within their own definition. Then you have the government based scholarships, which is again, the Indian governments, the state governments do give, then you have the destination countries government, that is U US government offers Indian students, uh, UK government offers Indian students some scholarships, for example. Uh, so I'm going to run through some sample examples. So government scholarships, you have this, uh, for example, Andhra Pradesh government, Telangana government has it. I'm not sure how many state governments have it, but I can confidently tell you that majority of the state governments do offer some sort of a scholarship uh, in terms of overseas education, where they would have some criteria about family income and the country and the course you're going for. Like, you know, if you can see it less than six lakhs and only one child is eligible from a family and stuff like that. So typically you're going to get a good 20, 25 lakh, not the entire amount, but it's going to fairly cover a good chunk. The problem is it's going to take time. Uh, it, you can't depend on it to actually start your master's, but by the time you complete, you would have things processed. Governments are obviously slow, right? So, but at least it's going to be lighter on your pockets, or for your parents' pocket in terms if you can get it. So there's no harm in just exploring and trying it out and applying. And hopefully if you can get in, that's a great one. Uh, then the other one is based on the caste, right? Uh, SC welfare, ST welfare, OBC, so minorities. So each of the governments would have certain funds given for that. So again, uh, if you see, they have talked about the countries they've mentioned, and they will give up to 20 lakhs. And they have obviously the criteria and, you know, based on what's your percentage in undergrad and what's your score in GRE, GMAT and English proficiency scores, etc. So they would obviously choose the best candidates from the pool that they get. So then you have this uh, country specific, as I said, like Humphrey scholarship, which is US government for Indian students are in general, actually global uh, citizens, they're giving it. But typically the expectation here is that you should have a public service in community, right? As in you work for some government, or the army and stuff like that. So typically they also expect you have a good work experience. So it is for a very niche set of people that will fit for, but you can explore. Like again, you have this Fulbright, Nehru Fulbright scholarship again, not for engineering candidates, but a lot of arts and you know literature and uh, public affairs, policy management, journalism and all of that. So you actually get, uh, it's a very well-known and very famous scholarship that funds a lot of your uh, cost. Then you have a uh, scholarship that's offered by UK government for Indian students. 
so that sort of you know again covers a good chunk of uh, scholarship then yeah that's about you know if you explore there are quite a few scholarships offered by state and central government and the destination countries government but i would say it's super competitive i i would not deny that at least this chevening nehru fulbright obviously would be given in like five ten people and then the competition would be across the country but the state specific ones i think they are a little bit more liberal but obviously it takes more effort to move around and get things done but if you can work around with your parents it's it's gonna really be a good a source of funds then you have the private scholarships like you have qs uh, you know academic excellence scholarship where they give you up to ten thousand uh, dollars again they have certain criteria of the quality of university you're getting in the course and your own uh, what we call it profile this one is specifically talking about attending an event also so that you should have enrolled with them sort of it then uh, british council uh, one of the ielts owners again they are also giving you ten thousand pounds if you are a citizen of india and joining of a postgraduate program in uk university then you have this AAUW again for women, uh, encouraging women. Again, these are all uh, what we call it private scholarships offered by specific company with certain agenda, be it uh, so corporate social responsibilities or be it to encourage international education. Then you have the university specific scholarships, which obviously are the uh, things that I would say is much more doable, more achievable. Uh, so if you just uh, maybe I'll just click on one of it uh, just to show you. Um, Okay, maybe I just end this. Yeah, not sure if I've opened it, so just give me a second. So, this is one university in USA, HY University, one of the top 100, 120 ranked universities. So, I'm just speaking. So, they are talking about the merit based scholarships. We have honors, dean scholarship, merit scholarship again. So, all of these, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Scholarships are clearly written uh, based on some elements we are obviously eligible for honors, deans, and all of that. Then you have this Jewish educators and all typical country based and co uh, you know, religion based and stuff. So, not everyone would come into it. But you can obviously read through it. So maybe I'll just open the Dean Scholarship, for example. So typically, this is uh, not only receiving, but they're also able to participate in designated honors activities. So you would be given an opportunity to work closer with the department people. So again, you are automatically considered. So this is you are automatically considered for a merit scholarship at the time of admission based on their academic background. Maybe I'll just take one more example to make this. Uh, more clear so every university would have the scholarships page all you have to do is if you're looking but i can tell you most of the universities clearly tell you that if it's merit based or dean based scholarship you don't need to do anything extra it's part of your application itself you don't have to but what is the highlight i want to highlight you is for example if you this right this is northwestern university in usa one of the top 50 ranked universities let's say be sure to complete your application by scholarship priority deadline december 1st to receive full considerate scholarship funding uh, the regular deadline is january 15th you can obviously apply later as well but what you have to understand is if you apply by priority deadline right so the basic rule of some we tell people is that apply as as soon as possible if you can apply you are maximizing your chances to be in the race to get a scholarship i'm not saying just because you are, you are the first person who has applied to university's program they would immediately give you a scholarship but the rule, the, the way they work is first come first serve is how they will evaluate a candidate if they feel the candidate is good enough to get an admit plus he's good enough to get a scholarship they would also offer the scholarship the moment they've offered scholarships to certain limited number of students even if they get a better applicant after a couple of months they would not be offering the scholarship to that later applicant why because they would have used all their funds already to offer the scholarship to certain set of students so the concept is don't just delay things assuming that the deadline is there for a particular university a good habit to work upon if you have time i mean i know a lot of you are looking for fall just try to do ASAP, right? If you have exam scores, maybe just take an action to look at universities and start applying. If you're yet to take exams, then try to plan. Obviously, you need to do well in the exams. I'm not saying to do it today, tomorrow. Just plan so that don't be a bit more relaxed thinking the deadlines are till April, May. For USA, I'm talking in special. UK and Australia, at least do, you know, by Feb, Feb, March, right? Don't really delay it because earlier you apply, the better your chances of uh, getting the, the scholarship, I'm saying, okay? Something similar for UK, for example, if you read through this. Uh, I mean, you can, I just told you any university, you just have to Google it, the scholarships for international students, graduate students, you'll get it. 
But again, if you see this, uh, you'll find an imperial college, they are giving, for example, an Indian specific uh, scholarship. Uh, I've seen that. So maybe I'll just open the dean. There's also Indian specific scholarship where I'm showing you something like, how are you gonna decide it, right? So here they're saying a candidate who submit their application before scholarship submission round, right? Whatever the priority deadline is and receive in a program will be eligible for this scholarship. So they would ask them to apply. So this is the second type of scholarships where you will first be given an admission. Then they would ask you to now, since you got an admit, you're eligible for scholarship. Just go ahead and apply with by filling a new form. Then based on the applicants they receive, they would start, you know, giving the scholarships. Some universities won't need you to do any additional thing. They would give it as and go that they will tell you the scholarship that you're getting. But the critical thing is that uh, what I wanted to tell you is that typically all the dean scholarships or merit scholarships would work with this logic that a particular department would decide who are the best candidates they want to offer the scholarship. So I've seen, for example, in the University of Leeds or Imperial, I don't remember exactly, where they mentioned that uh, two to three people from each department would be eligible, right? Like Department of Computer Science, Department of Biomedical Engineering or Biotechnology, et cetera. So the dean, along with the profs around them, would decide on who are the top three, top four candidates for whom they want to offer out of the people who got admitted, right? So typically, it's obviously competitive, but universities do give scholarships. Obviously, then there are universities which give scholarships uh, a little bit more leniently. Like, uh, you know, I'll show a couple of ones which I don't know, but these are just some samples. For example, this is Eshwa University. One of our students last intake got scholarship of $17,000. This is almost you're talking about 15 lakhs, right? Around more than 15 lakhs that you could save 14, 15 lakhs that they could cut down in terms of tuition fee. So this was a merit scholarship that he was giving along with the application only. We did not do anything separately. Then this one is Detroit Mercy, University of Detroit Mercy, again, top 200 in US uh, news. They typically, I'm consistently seeing they do offer scholarships of $10,000 if you apply early for a lot of students. Right. Again, you have Missouri University of Science and Technology, Mastrola, which also offers around ten to $20,000 scholarship, which will cut down the fee to 20 lakhs, 25 lakhs. So what I'm trying to say, apply early and you would get admit as well as scholarship if your profile is good enough. But the number of people that are getting scholarship is higher in certain universities, like the Detroit Macy's or Missouri University of Science and Technology. Right. Again, you have an, I've, I'm seeing that people, some people do get the dean scholarship of 20%, 30%, 40% of, you know, concession on the tuition fee. Uh, right. Then some more candidates, like this is one example I wanted to highlight some candidate. Uh, see that he got into ASU, which is one of the top 100, 110 universities in US, for example. His profile is fairly good for ASU. But he did not get any scholarship, obviously, because that's a very basic profile for that university. But Southern Illinois University, Edwards Village is like 300, 400 ranked university. It is really considering this profile to be very good because they don't get such a top profile. So typically, this student got 100% tuition waiver and also has given a assistantship opportunity so that he can also earn his own living expenses. So obviously, the student at the end of the day chosen to go for a low cost, zero cost. So he joined the Southern Illinois University. It's a personal choice. But what I'm trying to tell you is understand that your profile has to be there at the top 1% of the candidates who can join that particular program. That is when you will get a merit scholarship. Something similarly, the Texas Tech again is a little bit lenient in terms of giving this scholarship, which is they typically give you a $1,000 scholarship. But the best part is if you join a public university in Texas, right, be it Texas Tech or North Texas and Arlington, et cetera, uh, the Texas state has a rule that if an international student gets a scholarship of at least $1,000 and above, they would be converted into in state tuition fee. What is that? An international student would typically pay $20,000 if you can see this out of state. Whereas a domestic student would pay only 11,000. So the student is just converted into in-state tuition fee, which is basically giving you 50% off on your uh, tuition fee. That means your total cost is around 16 to 20 lakhs in Texas Tech if you get this scholarship. Uh, again, this is Detroit, as I told you, $10,000 scholarship. New Haven gives 20, 30. But these are a little bit more lenient scholarships that you can choose. Uh, New Hampshire uh, gave 7,500 uh, graduate scholarship to one of our student. Deep all again, 6,000. Uh, these are a little bit again lenient, Auburn, Stevens, uh, but ASU doesn't give more frequently. That's few times that we have seen for the students getting in. Cleveland, Dayton also gives a little bit the small amounts that you keep getting in. But again, the point I'm trying to tell, some universities are lenient, some universities are not. So the net net objective is not just a scholarship amount. What is the net uh, uh, tuition fee you have to pay? Like Stevens is around 
sixty thousand dollars for two years. Even if I get ten thousand, twenty thousand, it is still costing me more than forty, forty-five thousand dollars. So that means it's still a very costly university. So the net objective is not just get the scholarship for the sake of getting it, but you actually have to save final tuition fee that you are supposed to pay. What is the parameter that they typically look at to decide who is the top one percent? So typically, based on our conversation with a lot of universities, deans and profs over time, that we have understood they typically value your academic performance in undergrad a lot, uh, especially the the core courses that would fit into it. Let's say I'm applying for MS in computer science and I have done bachelor's in computer science, so they typically would look at you know what's your bachelor's CGPA in the core subjects like operating systems, data structures and algorithms, uh, and uh, you know other uh, advanced programming subjects, etc. Again, next, they look at your work experience. So obviously, what do I mean by strong academic performance? Which university you come from? What's your CGPA, the number of backlogs you hold? Right, Zero backlogs have a 9 or 8.5 CGPA, and you come from one of the premier institutes of the country. Obviously, that will be a standout for that university. Again, every university would have its own relative comparison. right? So University of Detroit Mercy would give you a scholarship even for 7.5. But ASU might expect you to have a 9.5 or 9.3 to even get a scholarship. So. One is that obviously the key factor is your academic performance. Sometimes I've seen work experience would help. If you have relevant work experience to the course that you're trying to pursue, they, if they find that this guy worked, let's say I worked with Microsoft or Google, right? And they really would appreciate a candidate with great experience and technical skill set. So that can let you stand out in the pool of candidates. Uh, demographic features, again, sometimes some scholarships are bound to be given to like students of African origin or Asian origin, Indian origin, China. Right, so typically that is something that is not in our hands based on the type of scholarship they'll evaluate. If it's a pure merit or dean based, it doesn't make any difference based on demographic. Exam scores obviously will make a difference. Again, a good GRE score, uh, you know, would make a difference. Even universities which have made it optional or waived it, they would really appreciate if a candidate has a good GRE score. A minimum, uh, you know, IELTS TOEFL score they set at at least a 0.5 band. Let's say 6.5 is the cutoff. Typically, I would say have a seven and above, let's say, to make yourself stand out in a scholarship sort of assessment. If you have a research experience that really adds well, you got a couple of paper publications, worked with some premier scientists or profs who have done extensive research with international publications and reputation. And if you have them along with your LORs or maybe of your, your resume, it really adds up. Then obviously there are need-based scholarships, uh, as I told you that based on the income levels of the family, they might as well consider that to give it. But those are very uh, specific to you know uh, merit, not merit, but need-based scholarships, and they would ask you to apply with certain more documents. The first four parameters of academic scores, exam scores, work ex, and research experience would be the key deal breaker that would be considered for pure merit and need-based scholarship. The other aspects of demographic and financial capacity would come for the additional scholarships. And sometimes they might ask you to provide additional proof to really be eligible for that scholarship. So the next part is part-time jobs. Obviously, US has this lot more in terms of university jobs, campus jobs, where you call it TA, RA, and GA, teaching assistantship, which is basically that you would help a professor to teach the classes or grade the assignments or help them in the labs and all of that to undergrad students or other uh, you know courses that a professor would take. Typically, you would be paid around a $15 uh, per hour, which is on a higher side if you do a TA or RA. And they would typically give you a, a scholarship of the tuition fee around 25 to 50%, like in-state tuition fees out of it. Sometimes you have seen 100% also, but on average, you can expect a half, 50% of reduction in your tuition fee. But it will be less than 10% of the students who join the university that would get a TA or RA. That's because you have to stand out academically and show your excellence in teaching assistance, as in your first semester performance. The research assistance is when you would help them in the labs to do research, uh, the external research that a prof would be doing of their own. When I say labs, it could be a biological labs, it could be computer labs, or maybe the research for a, a business prof on analytics or something, statistics and stuff like that. So not lab lab as such, but you will be helping them in their research. Again, the RAs are obviously also treated more, uh, you know, in terms of hourly rate, 15 plus, and also you'll get good scholarships and stuff like that. Again, very hard to crack it, but a person with a great research aptitude and experience in the past obviously would have a better chance to stand out. A good CGPA in first semester plus past experience of doing good research can help you to get a professor take you as a research assistant. But the common one, which is the most common one in campus jobs that majority would work if they get a job in campus would be graduate assistantship, where you will work with you know 
as a clerical support or maybe in the library in the gym in the reception international uh, you know, students division and stuff like that you know to do marketing and help them to reach out the university brand and stuff like that which are typically you know basic job uh, you don't need much technical skill set over here it's more uh, you know instead of hiring external employee they would use uh, it to you know do at a low cost and they will be paid around 10 dollars the minimal wage sort of a 10 to 12 dollars per hour depending on the state and the university that you are in uh, so that's still not a bad thing uh, but typically the other countries my tars are much more zero or negligible very very few actually the campus jobs are a little bit common and most of the people do go out and look for jobs outside the campus the outside campus jobs can be as low as working in a gas station or in a motel or a waiter in a cafeteria and stuff like that uh, they would be paid a little bit lesser than what you get over here but uh, people do get support of indian uh, business people and indian fellow people asians in general that they would hire you and they would give you a little bit of work to really sort your own personal finances so this is a short summary that i would want you to i mean can help you understand so usa the limit is 20 hours per week as a student that you can work in any of these jobs uh, obviously unofficially people work for longer obviously the unofficial rates would be lower side five dollars seven dollars depending on where and what you're working but let's say if i take an official 20 hours an average hourly rate of 12 dollars as a graduate assistant you would make around eighty thousand uh, per month which should be enough to sort your living expenses uk again uh, if you are making around 20 hours of work is what the legal uh, allowances you will get a minimum allowance of 9.5 10 pounds per hour again that is around eighty thousand canada would give you around 88 uh, but obviously the market now is harder i'm going to talk about that australia would pay slightly higher of the lot uh, they let you work for 24 hours 48 hours fortnight every two weeks you're allowed to work for 48 hours not exactly per week allowance but more two weeks allowance is what they have as a rule and they will be giving you 20 australian dollars per hour that will get you slightly more than a lakh uh, obviously the market right now is flooded with a lot of international students in canada uk usa in general Australia is relatively on the lower side with the international students in general and in the recent, see it's a cycle. Uh, Canada was flourishing three, four years back and a lot of people flocked there or went there. Now, if you have in the news in the last 48 hours, the Canadian international government, I mean the, the team or the ministry has put up a lot of strict guidelines of so earlier you need to put 10,000 Canadian dollars in GIC blocked account uh, to get visa. Now they're asking you to put $20,000 from the Jan 1st. Earlier, uh, they were allowing them to work more than 20 hours per week. Uh, as a temporary allowance, they were letting people to work for more than 20 hours. But coming from the 31st of April or 30th of April, like three, four months of the next year, they're saying you are only allowed to work for only 20 hours per week as a strict rule. And they're also cutting down in terms of the number of visas and all uh, big with more stricter guidelines and stuff like that. That's because I think they got a lot of candidates who are, uh, you know, students over there without jobs, part-time jobs or full-time jobs, which is making obviously hard for them to also get in. Uh, so it's a cycle, as I said, now Australia is looking a little bit more promising for students. Every three, four years, a lot of students go there and then it is also flooded. Meanwhile, Canada would get on the lower side and then people see more opportunities. Then people start looking at Canada, UK. So it's a part of it, right? So every time people start moving around as a preferred destination, USA as a as as usual always stands out with its uh, high paying jobs and stuff that it always chooses to be the best place in terms of uh, purely from the highest potential to earn post your uh, graduation part uh, third one is one year degrees or graduate diploma so you can cut down the cost for example if you look at this cincinnati uh, university in us one of the top 200 ranked so they have both ms in computer science and m engineering so m engineering is master of engineering in computer science ms is normal master of science so it's a one-year course. A lot of universities have M engineering, which are one-year courses where they would expect you to do similar or, or almost same amount of coursework. The only difference is the last semester may you will be removed to do thesis. So which lets you actually to not really focus on thesis in M, M engineering. It's much more easier to complete the degree. So that's why they let you complete in a year. So the tuition fee would not change much, to be frank, because as I told you, the rule is based on the cost per credit. Only there will be an additional registration fee for each semester that you will save like, let's say, 2 lakhs to 5 lakhs by doing in one year over two years. Or some people do in one and a half year over two years. So you will save a semester or two to actually, you know, in terms of paying some registration fee of $1,500, $2,000 per semester. But the key difference maker, I would say, is also that you would be coming out in the market to get a job a year early. You would not say waste your money of uh, what they call it living expense for second year. 
So the tuition fee, let's say both of it would cost you around 35, 37 lakhs. Cincinnati, either you do M engineering or MS, but you will only spend 10 lakhs of living expenses in M engineering, but rather here you have to spend 20 lakhs, which is something some people would say that it's better that I do a one year degree, but I will clearly discuss about this. See, if, if you are not aware of it by now, I want everyone, because that's how I tell any student to understand. Your living expenses can be sorted out by yourself, okay? Irrespective of what part-time job you do in campus or outside the campus. Maybe if you're doing an unofficial job, you might have to work a little bit longer. But people would actually can sort their own living expenses by sharing it with more people, being a little bit careful in terms of how you spend on your monthly expenses, even if you do any part-time job. So typically people, obviously, unless the market is bad and it's flooded with a lot of uh, people waiting for jobs and lesser opportunities, like people saying Canada is difficult in the last six months, might be difficult for another six to one year, then it, I think it should be good. Uh, UK is a little bit uh, you know, better than Canada, but not as good as Australia. US is obviously also, is also struggling with not everyone getting a job. But I would say if you have that heart to put it out, I can confidently tell you, that you can get a campus job or outside campus to really sort your living expenses. Now, the entire calculation should go into in terms of how can I fund my tuition fee? That is what I would say that you have to keep in mind. So it's not going to change much in one year or two years. I would recommend people to go to two year degrees if your skill set is very limited. A lot of people with less than one to two years of work experience or zero years of work experience go abroad. They have actually limited technical skill set that they would actually get a job in US or UK or Canada or Australia in the market. So typically it doesn't really help you by doing a degree in one year. But if you actually do it in two years, you have more time to settle down in a new country. Typically three to six months will go into sorting out your life in a new country itself. Right, accommodation, groceries, and you know, friends, and sort of all of this, college, universities, and all. By the time you realize that the one year degree would be done. So unless you are super sure that you have clear concepts and clear clarity on what to do and your skill set is of top notch, it doesn't make sense to people to really do it in a year. Maybe one and a half year, yes, you can do it. By the time you would have gotten some internships, would have gotten hang of the job market and you can try out there. But obviously, if you still want to cut down your cost, one year degrees are an option. Diplomas are obviously an option. Again, if you do in Canada, for example, even the graduate diploma in Australia. But the problem is your post study work visa would also cut down. Right. And the skill set that you learn there would be not as detailed in terms of a research or theoretical part compared to a typical master's. And if you come back to India or any other country, like people want to go to some other country also, uh, let's say people try to go to Canada and then think they can go to US. Yes, it's easier to go to US if you have a Canadian PR, for example, than Indian citizenship alone. But again, the point is you have to really have the skill set. Otherwise, with just that uh, one year degree, it's hard for you to really build your skill over there and people struggle with the jobs. And that obviously lead to you know short work term visa. You don't get a job, then you have to come back to India. If you have to come back to India, then this degree of a diploma would not have as much a value or respect of having a proper master's in an international university, even for the Indian job market or the other countries that you could look at. So keeping all this in mind, people have to be more calculated and careful. I'm not saying people should not do it. It's a personal choice. But what I'm trying to tell you is that understand the pros and cons before you take a call. Just don't blindly run behind something because someone said, is better or not so better. Uh, then the low cost universities. So this one, again, I would want to uh, put a thought to it. A lot of people know it. Some people are not aware of it. I'm just taking the example of US. This works across all the countries. Uh, university of Central Missouri is one famous university for a lot of Indian students because it gives you a two year degree at the cost of less than 20 lakhs. There are universities like Webster University, Levi's University, and a lot more universities, I can tell you, which are not even nationally ranked uh, in the top 400, 450. And a lot of people get the visas rejected if you go for it. So these sort of universities are 15 lakhs, 18 lakhs, 20 lakhs. It's OK. You can actually do it at a lower cost. I'm not denying it. But is that really worth the effort uh, of actually going abroad, even taking the 20 lakhs of a loan or rather your personal like, savings? Because I'll tell you a simple calculation that I want all of you to keep in mind. I'm not saying Central Missouri is bad. Uh, personally, it's a choice. It's only fit for certain people. Don't blindly run behind something. Because Central Missouri is not even nationally ranked university. It's a public university relatively, but it is not a nationally ranked university. So the point I'm trying to tell you is, uh, if you can get into a better university, it costs you 5 to 10 lakhs more. Don't drop out of it. It costs you 30, 35 lakhs. It's not really a big deal. I'll tell you a couple of calculations. Even if you get a job of a very basic level in USA, for example, it's going to pay you 50 lakhs. 
60,000 USD. It's a very, very basic developer, a tech job, or even any construction management, civil engineering, anything I'm talking about. So if you're getting at least that 45, 50 lakh job, even if you actually manage to go to a good university and that helps you to get a job three to six months ahead of a normal university, that itself covers your 15, 20 lakhs of a difference. As I'm telling you, even if you earn 50 lakhs in a year, for every three months, you must be earning two lakhs. So you are saving almost the 10 to 20 lakhs, even if you get a job three to six months ahead of, you know, by joining a better university. Value your skill set and the opportunity to learn. The 10, 15 lakhs amount looks a big shot now. But after you go there and sort of settle down there, it's not really a big deal, right? And I, I'm trust me, a lot of like HDFC, Kadillas and Avanches are giving loan. A, a case I can tell you, a student who got admitted to Arizona State University have a, a agriculture income of 4 lakhs, right? And he was given a loan of 60 lakhs. That lender is believing in student to actually earn in the future. They are not really believing that that person or family can actually repay it of 60 lakhs of amount of a loan. The trust that lender is taking is that they believe the student got into a top university. That means the potential is there for the student to get a job and then you know pay it back to us. Some external lenders are believing you guys, then you should have trust in yourself to really choose a university. I mean, okay, it's okay. Don't go for 100, 1 crore or 80 lakhs, 70 lakhs, right? If it's super hard for your parents to crack it. But even for a typically an average uh, financial support, you can easily get a 30, 40 lakh loan, and that can be enough to get into a very top 100, 150 ranked universities if you calculate it properly. Like California State University, there are eight to nine campuses. They are top notch. At least four or five of them are nationally ranked. There are public universities. There are 24 lakh. Yes, the California State living expense would be on the higher side. San Francisco State University again comes in California State. It is also around 26, 27 lakhs. San Jose State University. There are quite a few universities that are. Missouri is one state where the living expense on the lower side, even the university fees is on the lower side. California is living expense on the higher side, university fees is on the lower side. People can choose this out to, you know, find out that best fit of universities that fits your budget. As long as you can fund it, uh, that should not stop you from actually, you know, going for a better university. Decide a university just because the cost is on the lower side. Rather choose the one which gives you a better opportunity to learn and actually get a job quicker, get a better job. A small 10-20% of a difference in the job opportunity you get would actually make a deal breaker, right? So don't underestimate the quality of education and university that you can get in. If you have a good profile, don't just trust someone saying that do it in Levi's or do it in Webster, do it. I'm not saying Levi's is bad, but if you can get in much better, don't compromise on it just because, you know, it has, uh, you know, lower fee. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of university quality that you should choose. So I'm going to talk about the loans part. Uh, I'm not going to go into the process bit, but I have a couple of points I want you to keep in mind for people who are future aspirants that will understand or help you to actually choose a university that you want to go for. Obviously, you need documents. The processing happens within two to five days. If you have all the documents in place from NBFCs, uh, you will get a loan offer very quickly in like less than a week or even if we have seen as to, like a quickest that we have seen left in the recent times would be two to three working days that a student got a loan. Of 40 45 lakhs uh then you will pay the processing fee of one percent or slightly less than that and then you would get a sanction letter go for visa you get it and then you can clear and do all your education and they don't let they don't ask you to pay the emi still the three years so you'll have a moratorium period also till then you'll be only expected to pay around two thousand three thousand rupees per month which basically means that your parents have no uh you know headache by three years you will be graduating in two years and then you have one year to search for a job most of the students will figure out something or the other, at least in that one year of span to get some job that they can easily pay the EMA of 50K, 60K, which is not a big amount once you look at in dollars. So these are some of the lenders that we have partnered with ICICI, IDFC, Axis Bank, Bank of Florida, the national central banks, public banks, private banks, and avances in credits. And then you have the great things like Empower Prodigy. These people have nothing to do with your parental income. They only look at you as a student. They look at the quality of university you're going. They have a list of universities. If you can actually get admitted into their list of universities, they would give you the entire tuition fee in most of the cases without any worry about your parents' bill, parents' annual income, monthly income, existing EMS, and stuff like that. So I am telling that there are a lot of opportunities to not stop yourself from getting into a best university, provided you actually have enough effort, or rather the academic profile and the exam scores to really get into a good university. But obviously, to keep in mind, if you want to optimize your loan offer, as in the interest rates and the amount you can maximize, try to build a strong profile in terms of your CGPA, limited backlogs, have good exam scores, get admitted to good university. 
it's not just for the sake of uh, you know loan for the sake of visa also for the sake of your uh, learning and the job opportunities post to graduate try to choose the best possible universities right a good uh, credit profile of your and co applicants like father or any paternal or maternal uncles also help you to get a good interest rates right obviously negotiation helps you to cut down certain aspects but applying early also helps you i will give an example for this just jan spring and tech the hcc kerala started by giving loans at 11.25% in the month of october since the mid of november all the students that we are helping are getting at 11.75 to 12.25 same kind of profiles so they just said that they have increased the rate of interest because it's closer to the intake right so applying earlier getting admits will help you get scholarships applying and getting scholarships and lower fees will help you to also get a good you know chance to block a visa slot also get a good loan if you apply early and get all the things much more smoother so make things much more easier for yourself by you know deciding to act upon faster and more clear than you know delaying it to the later part yeah so that's it from my side so as i told you uh, 25 lakhs to 30 lakhs you can easily do it you can get into nationally top ranked universities assuming that living expenses can be taken care by you so that's not really a big problem for most of the students i can tell you uh, you you would be lucky if you get scholarships scholarship is not that everyone can get but i can tell you that if you choose let's say you can get into tier 1 universities but you try for tier 2 tier 3 universities with your profile you have maximum chances part time job children will get the chance of choosing low cost universities i can tell you one example if you just go to a website for example right let's say and you want to do masters in computer science so i'm just clicking in computer science and i click on this then you have the filters on the left side where you can also cut down on the tuition fee that you want to do i want to do under 30 lakhs so around 40000 usd so i can start getting you know universities which are offering the courses under 30 lakhs so you can start then you can choose the universities So obviously you can get some universities which are even less than twenty lakhs also. I'm not denying it as I'm telling you. Uh, in the California state and all of this, you especially get universities which are on the lower cost. So the role of the decision you can do research here, but choose the ones which are best for you, not purely on the financial aspect. Is what I I would want to stress on. Okay. Uh, the PDF part, just in there. I think we are good to go. So uh, I think I've exactly taken around forty minutes. So this is the end of the session. I will be happy to take up questions if you have any. If not, we are good to go uh, for the day. In there, we will share the recording so you can happily, you know, access it and watch it. Uh, um, yeah, I think that should be helpful for you to access the content you want. Going abroad for MS or PhD, Girish. I think it's a personal choice. See, MS is with an objective of. getting a job where your personal preference is to really settle down by doing a job it is phd obviously you are taking a step towards doing extensive research yes people get into industry as in to do a full time job after phd also there are lot of programs you find in different parts of the world uh, where they would have the migration from a phd research candidate towards an industry guy uh, but the point is phd is not everyone's cup of tea first thing to get admitted into phd you should have a strong uh, research background if you have interest to spend 5 to 6 years of your time on a solid research topic and you would really want to consider your career in academia right to become a prof or even if not then look up for a career opportunity to go to industry if your goal is to work at the end of the day do ms if your goal is to explore research really enjoy that part of doing research and figuring out things and contributing to the you know that domain of your choice then phd makes sense because it's not an easy call a lot of universities in general also if you get into phd let you do master courses in the first two years or so then you can actually you know they will put a test for you and then decide whether you are qualified for phd or they would ask you to move out of the university with a masters degree so typically a lot of students they only understand and they drop out of it as some people really are not ability wise qualified as per university and they would ask them to move out of university but it's a personal choice uh, if work is your ultimate goal then ms if research is what excites you and you really are patient enough to put that effort then phd we go for one year masters in uk and then for two year work visa okay and after working for this still we couldn't receive sponsorship from the company then what we have to do without visa will there be opportunity in india or any other country settled down so abhishek it's a good question i have asked so what i would tell you is see if you have a good job right uh, companies do sponsor so recently the uk government is also trying to strict and couple of things like uh, 
uh, they are only allowing uh, people to students to carry the dependence if it's a research uh, course of masters which most of the uh, masters people don't get into research masters uh that so that basically means they're not allowed to carry the dependence number two they are also putting a work visa construction constraint that at least thirty six thousand pounds per year should be the minimum salary for a person to be eligible for work visa earlier it was 26 or 27. they are also trying to stick uh you know make it strict for uh not so great candidates to stay there so obviously the thing is if you do your masters in a good university and you got an opportunity to work in a good company for a couple of years and let's say by some bad luck it did not work out i can tell you that in that two years of experience you can re you know you can earn enough to re you know repay your uh, master's tuition to a greater extent and come back to india you should get a job see the object is that if you have the skill set you will definitely get a job yes obviously dollars pounds versus INR, the amounts will not tally as it is if you get a 30 40 lakh 50 lakh job there you might get 10 to a lakh job here and that sort of a loan of 20 25 lakhs will become too big of an amount i would not deny it but if you are lucky enough to work for a couple of years or one year one and a half year you can actually clear most of your debt uh that's a risk that's always there for all the countries us three year work visa canada two to three year australia is giving longer work visas three to six years of post study work visa now uh so typically that's something they're trying to help out but yeah at the end of the day if you join master's program in a good university which has international reputation and you've built your skill set i think you don't have to worry about coming back to india and get a good job or in the other countries again it's a hard thing that you say can i try for us obviously it's super hard european markets some of them are open but then again you have to learn the languages and you know sort of try to get there uh, european markets as in germany sweden right you can try out those are eastern europe maltas and uh, estonia's are a little bit more open but yes international degrees have more reputation so you can try out in that parts or even the middle east like dubai and all but it is what it is so the risk is always there for everyone Muhammad Afzal, see the chances i cannot estimate it depends on what your skill set is and what kind of university you're going for uh I cannot tell you in a very number style, but I would say that two years old. Sorry. So to maximize your chances, what I would tell people is go for programs where you get one year of industry, which basically means you have got a proper four year work, four year visa, two years of study. Those second year is purely internship. You have a lot of time where you will work in a company, which means you are actually getting a real experience. Plus, you can also try out in other parts of companies to sit for interviews and crack and get the job market and stuff like that. Plus, you have two more years of time to really get a job. So if you have that, then you get the sponsorship, you apply for work visa, then you have good time to. It is not as hard as US in terms of H1B being a lottery, at least for UK, Canada and Australia. They have their own point system and you have to just be eligible for it if you get a good job. So electrical engineering in general, anywhere in the world is not as easy as computer science or analytics. There's no doubt about it. But if you have really interest in core engineering and you have done uh, your master's in a good university, then I think you have a good chance to really. So if possible, if you have that fear for everyone in UK, my suggestion is to try for a placement year course. Choose the universities where you know you can also get it. So that means you are increasing your chance of having a success to get a good job quicker and have a longer visa time to really settle out there uh, if you actually can get into a placement year course. Supply chain management, logistics management is having scope in Australia uh, or not in the course of a PR in future. So um, I would say in Australia, now a lot of you know job opportunities are lying out. Supply chain logistics is a great course to do. But if you ask me from management perspective, the order I would put is first business analytics is in demand from the management domain. Second, I would put is the supply chain and logistics everywhere be it canada us or australia or uk a lot of uh, warehouses and uh, business with a lot of uh, you know logistical moments are happening at a global level also that the companies are really hiring a lot of people in that and that is easy for an international candidate to work relative to being on the sales and marketing side relatively being on the hr side and strategy side etc of the business domains i personally believe uh certain jobs are harder for an international candidate to work with you know the local citizens and sort of do the business but certain things like analytics and supply chain logistics are easier to really get a job and also be at that uh, what do you call it uh, easy for the companies to hire you also 
because that won't be a big problem for them whether they hire an international candidate or local candidate so i would say supply chain logistics is a great course to go for that's my second pick in terms of the management obviously mis information systems would come ahead of it but okay then i'll the third one uh, the analytics then management information systems or information systems and then the third one would be the supply chain logistics project management all of that in one section i would put it so there are a lot of opportunities for sure australia is with a lot of opportunities in general because of lack of uh, what i call it a lot of international students coming there over the last four or five years since the covid so that is why they are also giving longer uh, post stay work visas uh, and they are letting people to really settle down uh, like once you work for four or five years in australia you get a pr also right earlier it was uh, obviously only two years of work visa now they are giving up to five years post study work visa which is based on the cities that you study and the type of specialization you do so four to five years of post study work visa should ideally be super easy for you to really get a job and be eligible for you know work visa and then migrate to pr also and supply chain is a good course anyway in general i would say will i get a job in other countries abhishek i am assuming the uk question you are asking about uh, see that's what i'm saying abhishek if you do it in a good university which has international reputation one and if you have good skill set see can i try in us it won't it would make a small positive impact that you have masters in uk university compared to an indian university bachelors uh, but again us is hard for anyone to get in from directly job market point of view canada also but if you say that i am open to go for you know european countries are open to go for middle east yes with an international degree you are increasing your chances by let's say 20 25% at least i'm just giving a, an approximate number there is no rule as such what i'm saying is that it adds value if you have an international reputation and especially if you actually improve your skill set if you really can work in a in a company in uk that means you are good enough to really get a job in lot of other countries in the world and with an international degree you should have better chances to apply there and get an opportunity that's a recent rule abhishek that's not yet passed the bill is there uh, the rishi sunak is trying to get it uh, to win some votes in the coming elections that they want to put a minimum salary of 36000 per year to be eligible for work visa sort of it uh, so that's not yet passed as of now i think it's 26000 pounds or something they are trying to increase it and sort of cut down uh you know uh, the international people who are not too qualified uh, you know they want to rather give it to the domestic citizens because of the unemployment being on the higher side for the locals so masters in america shaikh mohammed always is the best choice i can put if you can put effort to get into a good university by clearing all the exams and can fund your education because the salaries that you get in us is way better than anywhere and that quality of companies that you get is the best you can so us is the best option i can if i personally have to recommend anyone uh, if you have no bias towards any country for any reason like ease of pr was there in canada relatively longer post study work visa in australia the cost of education being lower on the uk and stuff if you remove all of that and just say forget about all the constraints now what is the best place to go for usa the quality top notch education the best universities are highest in us you get to you know join the good universities and learn there a lot of companies are there that help you to you know get good jobs and they pay you the best uh, if you have the skill the best salary you can get as compared to uk canada australia and usa in dollars usa would be the best that the offer so i would always say go for us if you can uh, and what is the best course obviously it is the best in the world right now but doesn't mean everyone has to do that it's your personal choice people are getting jobs in um qualcom right a lot of these other electrical nvidia and stuff like that if you have the right skill intel and stuff a lot of people that i know personally are working in intels and you know uh, qualcoms and stuff like that globally that's just your personal choice whether you want to stick with ec or it but just that a very number wise it jobs are much much more in number than this any other core job so like in india or like in any other country so that makes it a little bit easier if you have affinity towards you know a little bit of coding and interest towards it ec to cs is more easier acceptance of universities also in terms of admission process and transition as well so that's a personal choice that you can take right okay guys then i think we have reached the end of session and uh, i hope it was helpful for all of you so we will be doing lot more sessions coming uh, right at regular intervals on different topics of study abroad so yeah if you have any suggestions you have any topics that you want us to talk about we'll be happy to pick up and do it uh, otherwise i think we are done for the day the moderator you can just take it over and then please end the session
thank you sir and also uh, you guys can register for ielts gr and duolingo classes for free thank you so much for attending the session